Hello, Yeshua Network. Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome to another entire Bible read through, Mark 15. It is a blessed day, and uh, while everybody's logging on, I just want to start the video off with a reminder uh, that on Yeshua Official on Facebook, uh, we have a uh, resource link with all sorts of videos linked by categories and topics. Uh, we also have information there for all of our groups. We have a lot of groups on Yeshua Official on Facebook. Uh, we do have, of course, the um, the YouTube channel, Yeshua Network, and uh, lots of things going on. So we, uh, we're doing great things here at Yeshua Network, but not because of us, but because we're submitting to the will and the commandment of Christ. So we're super, we are being super blessed here, and I'm super blessed to have you guys. Uh, please also remember that we have our meetup coming up September 29th, uh, or like September 30th, and uh, October 1st. It's a weekend, Saturday, Sunday here in Nashville. So you can find out more information about that at our meetup group. So be sure to check that out as well. And we hope that as many of you as possibly can make it, will make it because the more the merrier. We just, we want to meet you. We want to see you. We want to hang out with you and fellowship with you and all that kind of stuff. It does have a theme, which is breaking the chains, but I do want to state too that I don't imagine that the whole thing is going to be uh, you guys just listening to me talk. I don't want you to think that. I don't know if I've said that yet. Uh, you know, I really want to more focus on us fellowshipping and hanging out and getting to know each other and talking about the Lord and and praying together and things like that. So it, it will be structured, unlike the other meetups we've done. It'll be more structured, but it will be, uh, there will be a plenty of time for us all to get to know each other and 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 hang out. So I'm super, super excited about it. I, I want to see you guys. So um, as people log on to, I just want to uh, cover something that was asked by a few people in the last video, which was a couple weeks now. Um, people had asked about the comment I made about Yeshua bruising his heel on the serpent's head in the garden. And I said, this is where, you know, it also begins. Uh, it began where uh, Yeshua would bruise his heel. And I didn't give any background to that or give any explanation to that. Um, again, because this is why I, I soapbox, I realize that when I try to shorten things, I connect dots and, and scriptures and things and concepts in my head, and I don't explain them, and that's bad. And so that is why I soapbox, because I know that th these kind of things will happen that afterwards people are like, wait, what? Where did you get that? How'd you tie that together? And things like this. So anyways, m the comment I was making and the reason why I was saying like what happened in the garden was kind of the beginning of like the end of like everything being cleaned and fixed was I was I am under the impression yes of course persuaded that the reason why Yeshua was also sweating blood from anxiety and you know the fears and things like this but I believe it was also it was a moment where he was really having that internal fight with his flesh I'm persuaded of that and that's why I believe he was sweating and that's why he was asking them stay awake and pray with me and you'll notice that there's no other time in the Bible, not when he was carrying the cross, not when he was standing in trial for either the high priest or when he was going to Herod. Like, he, it doesn't say he was sweating blood. And, and so I'm under the impression that what happened in the garden internally in Yeshua's heart and in his mind is when it really com was complete. Like, yes, it was really complete when he actually died on the cross, and it was really, really complete when he rose again. But I believe that for Yeshua, it was complete in the garden because he was making his last petition to the Lord to say, I know what's coming. If you can make this stop, then please make it stop. I don't want to have to go through with this if, if there is another way. And then when he says, but not my way, but yours, I believe that that was really the beginning of everything being fixed because i don't think the devil thought that he would do that i don't think the devil thought that he was who he who he was and he thought that he would go into his flesh and choose by his flesh and fight for his flesh like basically most of us other humans have done at some point and he was waiting for him to have a weak moment but when yeshua um says but not my will but yours and i believe he surrendered to like really to it, like he really gave over to it, which is why it doesn't mention later that he was sweating blood anymore. So I believe that there was a form of surrender that was truly complete in that moment. I hope that makes sense. And so the, that's the reason why I, I was saying that that's where he began, where he, that was the, the moment where he also bruised the serpent's head. And that 
that ties really though to the cross and the and my connection for the bruised heel because the bible doesn't talk about an actual bruised heel and roll with me on this concept i didn't want to think too long so i'm going to try to be quick there is no other time that yeshua can get a bruise we know that when he was raised, he was raised with a new body, and we know according to scripture that the body he has is the example of the body we're going to get. And the Bible tells us that if we get run through with the sword, we will not die. We won't ever get sick. Like the new bodies are basically like they're, I don't want to say they're like Superman, but like even if somebody stabs us, we're not going to bleed out or we're not going to, it's just like it'll go and it'll go out and then we're healed. So that means that in my opinion, Yeshua will never get bruised. He'll never get another scar. He'll never get another wound. So how could he have a bruised heel in the future? Which means that at some point between the garden and when he died on the cross, his heel must have gotten bruised. My understanding and my thinking is, is that when they drove the nails through his feet, it was after they drove the nails through his hands. I don't know why I think that. It's just my persuasion again. But I feel like they had to do his hands first so that they would know where to place the feet because the hands have to be on the crossbar. His feet can be anywhere on the lateral bar. Does this make sense? That, that, this is my own calculation, right? So I'm under the persuasion that when the last nail went into his feet, that nail didn't just go into Yeshua's feet because in reality, Yeshua was not supposed to die according to the cosmic law of what happened in the Garden of Eden, which you guys have heard me talk about. So I'm just gonna say that. And hopefully you've watched enough videos in the past of the series to know what I'm referring to. So roll with me, this is the concept. When Yael or J-A-E-L J -A -E -L, put the nail in the king's temple while he was sleeping, she ended his kingdom. And I think that that analogy was that when the nail went into Yeshua's feet and officially nailed him finally to the cross, I am persuaded that nail is what bruised the serpent's head. It went through his feet thus went through his heel and that sealed the deal or sealed the fate of satan because it was done and when yeshua was on the cross he said it is complete it is done he didn't say once i'm dead it is complete it is done so my concept here is is that i think the the nail through the temple to end that kingdom is equivalent to yeshua nailing the end of satan's kingdom when he inherited the earth if you will when Adam and Eve broke their covenant with God in the garden. So, and if you watch that last video when I, I was talking about this, these, this will all be like one flow. So for those of you who are watching it in video and you're not watching it live, this will make more sense because we're like weeks apart from the last video. But if you go back and watch it and you take it, we're weeks apart from the last video. You didn't know that? That's not what I'm flipping out about. What are you flipping out about? Go ahead, continue. So... So this will be, this will make more sense, I think, if you're watching it like smoothly from one video to the next on, on what I'm saying and what I said. So yeah, this is, this is exactly why I, I do Soapbox and I go into these details and stuff and I, and I do apologize and I know you guys say you like it and some of you, you know, you crack jokes about it, but I really, it's not that I want to hear myself speak. It's just that I feel that these kind of little details could absolutely be, um, I think it's super important. Yeah. I love your soapbox because of what just happened. So I don't know if this is right, and I don't know if, no, this is something happening here. Oh, real quick though, before, because yeah. I kind of stopped when you did that. So he says it was complete while he was on the cross. Not He didn't say it's complete once I die and raise again. And I, I think that that's important. I think that that's important because one, he can't tell a lie. And if he says it's complete, then it is complete. So if we take a look at what was complete at the moment he said that, then I think that nail in that, and then also the they offered him, of course, the wine on the, the sponge, which was the final prophecy. And he had to cry out, Lord, why have you forsaken me, right? Like, why did you have this ha happen this way? So I think the nail was indeed what broke or killed the kingdom of 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 satan like his reign of earth that nail going into his heel and this is just my own little personal like vibey feely thing so and and so i I'm, I'm i apologize if i took too much liberty in the last video i i do apologize i don't mean to do that i guess that and, and maybe i do that whether i soapbox or not but i do i do feel that when i try to shorten my my my, my two cents i seem to take more liberties because i'm trying to make leaps 
and I, and I feel that that's probably dangerous for me personally. So um, I, I think it is important for me to go through the, 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 the process of connecting all the dots and explaining why I am persuaded of my persuasions. So anyways, that's, I just wanted to make, say that before we went on to the rest of the video. So if you remember what you were gonna say. It's a little bit out there, not out there in terms of like off topic, but it's, it's a little bit, uh, I'm having a, <laughs> sorry. I'm realizing we're in video right now and I'm having a total brain melt. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if now is the time to bring it up though. So I'm just gonna- Go for it. I don't know. I'm thinking? gonna go for it. Okay. Um, so as you're talking about the situation and as you're talking about the heel, uh, the, 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 he will bruise his heel on the serpent's head. And as you're talking about the nail dri being driven into Yeshua and, and that completes his execution, Mm -hmm. though he doesn't die immediately upon the nail being put in there that is the completion of the crucifixion execution without it it's not really complete yet yes so and that is also the way you would at that time that they prosecuted criminals and those guilty of crimes yeah well what if the reason why satan loses the kingdom is because he breaks the contract and the contract is that he may he may he 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 may steal kill destroy he may mess with let's just put it that way or he may bring to uh uh bring to judgment uh only those guilty of crimes and if he if he executes a complete innocent which yeshua was actually a sinless being mm -hmm. the only one ever i think that's probably said even in scripture mm -hmm. That by doing that, he breaks his contract. He does something outside. Satan has now performed something outside of the boundaries that he was given. Yeah, this is what was said last video. Yeah, but I didn't. I didn't have it thought of that exact way. Yeah, I, I understand that there was a contract thing, but it, it hadn't snapped into my mind quite yeah. as clearly as it did. So I'm sharing to you right no, now. No, I'm glad. Okay, I just want to make sure that that was cleared last week. Okay, I got you. Yeah. So it is my persuasion that when he. When Adam and Eve did what they did with eating the fruit, and then they were kicked out, the earth became his domain. And the rule of death was death was for those who sinned. Since Yeshua never sinned, the fact that Satan being dominion over this earth allows Yeshua to die. He has dominion here. See? So he allows Yeshua to die. He pushes for it, really. Yeah, he, he even pushes for it. He mocks him, the whole thing, right? He tempts him, all that kind of stuff. He doesn't fall to the temptation. And so the fact that Yeshua gets that final nail means that Yeshua has now, first of all, he verbally and spiritually and psychologically surrenders to God's will in the garden, right? And then he physically surrenders to God's will on the cross. He doesn't use, he doesn't, he, he doesn't use his last breath to say, angels come and remove me, right? Which is what they're mocking him to do. Instead, he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? And then he says, it is done. And then he gives up the ghost. So yeah, I, I believe that it is Satan who actually broke the contract at that moment. Yeshua did it, but Satan allowed it to happen because he has dominion of the earth. And because he allowed it, thinking that at any moment Yeshua is going to, even to the very last second, I think Yeshua, that, that Satan was kept doubling down. He's like, no, nah, he's going to mess up. He's going to mess up. This is not the guy. He, this is not the time. This is not it. He, this, isn't, this isn't him, right? And so he kept doubling down, doubling down, and that was why when that last nail went in, it's the equivalent of Yale's nail going into the king's head, finishing yeah. and completing Satan's wow. con Satan's kingdom. Yeah, and it totally makes sense why Yeshua had to be an immaculate birth, and why they why there's this sort of Christianese thing where he doesn't carry the sin of the Father. You know what I'm saying? He was a complete. He did so. Yes, exactly. Uh, when I think about okay, well, is he? Is he? This is just this is. Your forgive process. me guys forgive me guys you're probably all way ahead of me but this is this is my process about this um when i think about okay well yeshua was the only innocent that died therefore boom broke the contract and then the the first question that comes to my wait, wait weren't there other innocents that died what about little tiny children weren't they innocent and the the if we look in the old testament we see that actually there is a whole code of how uh the children were responsible for some of this were, were held responsible as for some of the sins of the of the generations that came came before them yeah and so and and there was also all kinds of uh um um stipulations and redemption stipulations such as your firstborn had to be redeemed so 
So you look at it and you go like, actually, yeah, there's really no way to walk the earth without either being a recipient of a broken law from your ancestors right. and most likely completely breaking all the laws yourself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So well, like, that's, every, yeah, go ahead. Your well, no, no, you no, know, just even we are receivers of the curse of Adam and Eve. Yeah. Right. And yes. our life being limited to 120 years, like all these things are upon us because we have gotten our flesh from our parents and the seed. And he yeah. cursed. He cursed that. So right. therefore it transfers. But because Yeshua was born of a virgin, that didn't transfer to him. Right. Yeah. And so therefore, like you would think that then therefore Satan would know not to let it happen. Right. But I'm I'm not sure that Satan understood everything that was happening with Yeshua and, and everything of who he was. I, I'm yeah. not persuaded that he he knew because if he did, why would he? He Satan himself could have shook in the earth. He could have struck a lightning bolt and broke the curtain. He could have he could have he could have given plagues to the guys who were crucifying him because they were sinning so bad by crucifying Christ and beating Christ. He could have easily like had bears come and eat them. I mean, right. he he had he has dominion over the earth, right? So even if he can't do necessarily like he can't spiritually attack a person, he can possess a bear <laughs> and eat the guys who are eating wow. Yeshua, it was right? almost like that moment was the test for the accuser. Yes, exactly. And that's why the nail through, and this is my thought, because that's it. Just like the nail drove in through, when she drove the nail through the king's temple while he was sleeping, even though the nail went through Yeshua, there's a lot of symbolism here, and I don't know if you guys want it. By driving the nail through Yeshua, it went through imperfect flesh, or excuse me, perfect flesh, in sin, like non sin, yeah, sinless. Thank you. Sinless flesh, sinless blood was on the nail, pinned to the tree, matching the tree fruit that came onto Adam and Eve, right? Yeah. So, like, it went all the way back to the garden, right? But it went through him, and that, that blood would have gone into that tree trunk off through the nail. Well, that was putting that was his head and if you think about it so what if you it just in case anybody is out there going yeah you're kind of stretching it though nathan like what about the whole thing about on on the serpent's head how is the tree serpent's head so the thing about a head is if you think about it satan only really has one weapon it's his intellect and his ability to be a, a silver tongue devil right he speaks trickery he speaks lies. He is the father of lies. And that is, you know, on the head. So if you were to attack Satan or you were to kill Satan, it would be just like the king who is sleeping. Well, Satan was sleeping on Yeshua. He wasn't aware. And she was able to drive it into his temple. Well, when Yeshua received the nail through his feet and it was the sinless blood and, and, and then went into the tree, the symbolism was, is that that would have gone into symbolically into satan's head because now no matter what he said no matter what what lies he he spoke he no longer has dominion his kingdom has ended and he only has that weapon so it would have gone through in my opinion his head Do, you get what i'm trying and i know that's yeah. a stretch that's just poetry for well, me an interesting thing is it's, it's at the place of the skull it is on golgotha yeah the yeah. place of the skull too yeah there's so much symbolism to it like there's a lot right and depending on what you believe too, that if, if, I'm not sure I'm persuaded of this, but if you believe that blood went down when the earth shook, it cracked open the earth below the cross and the blood went all the way down, all those stories, and then fell onto the top of the, of the uh, ark that was underneath him, right? But if right. that did happen, that would make a heck of a lot of sense too, because that's exactly what the high priest had to do when he went into the holies holies. He had to sprinkle the blood on the, what is called the um, uh, mercy seat, Right. And then God would show up as a gold smoke and he would interact with the high priest. Yeshua is the high priest. His blood sprinkling on finally the ark would be like the completion of the whole process. So, again, I'm, I can't say that I know that because I haven't seen the underground cave and I haven't seen the ark myself. I haven't seen the DNA thing. Right. But it's like all these things that happen with Yeshua. I don't think it just happened on the cross is what I'm saying. And I know that, you know, we often think of the cross is it the end all be all. I think that I think it happened the night before the cross when he began to speak the promises onto the apostles. And then I think for him personally, 
it really was completed in the garden like that's just me this is and when we get there and we read it maybe you, you guys will maybe i'll be able to explain it better but i do think like this from everything the putting the crown on the, the crown of thorns on his head thorns as we had talked about was a result of what was a result of the sin there were, according to god he said you will you will toil and you will have to work the oh. land and there will be thistles and thorns that will pop up so were they not there before so our thorn is the plant in a plant with thorns were there no plants with thorns before adam and eve sinned and god put them there to actually make gardening hard and painful and then what was the thing that was put on his head a crown of thorns and what was the thing that bruised the what his heel bruised on satan his head and what was Yeshua and what was Satan's crown? His mouth, his lies. Like it's a literal circle, no matter which way you look at it. Garden, tree, fruit, crown, head, nail, head, crown, fruit, tree, heel, garden. It's just like it all do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah. It it goes in a complete circle, like in so many different levels. And yeah, it's on a mountain called Golgotha, skull. It's just it's so much so and I, I i did wrong by you guys just not further explaining that so i i had to make the beginning of this video for the sake especially of people watching live that was awesome yeah see jennifer says once he came into agreement with god will in the garden exactly that, that for me is i think when that for me is when i think like cosmically everything shifted and i think that even everything shifted in yeshua and I'm not saying that he stopped sweating blood, but I think it's interesting how it wasn't mentioned at any other point. Like, I think Pilate would have mentioned it. Like, are you being quiet? Because you like, what's going on? Why are you sweating blood? Like, are you okay? Are you able to talk? Like, if I saw a guy sweating blood, I, I would be a little bit more concerned about their health, about their psyche. I wouldn't just be like, aren't you going to respond? Like, just treat him normal. Right. So I feel like at some point, they stopped being able to see that he was sweating blood. So either he stopped in the garden or he was just covered by the blood from them beating him that they, they thought that that's where the blood came from. I don't know. But there seems to me to be that there was a, something that happened in Yeshua himself in the garden. Like that was his real moment of surrender. And I think that that speaks to the flesh side of all of us, right? Because I think the hardest thing for all of us to do is that we can clearly see that God being sovereign and, and totally unlimited could absolutely come up with another way. But our ways are not his ways and i think I, I think it blesses us tremendously to really understand like we don't get to see the flesh human side of yeshua as much as in that moment in the garden and when he cries out father father why have you forsaken me like those moments to me are like the most human we get to see him and without that it would almost be like he is the guy who's just hovering over the you know the ground and just floating to every city and just speaking healings and throwing them out like the candy <laughs> you, you get what i'm trying to say like him having that human side really makes makes i think the lessons he wanted to bestow upon us through his walk and his life and his teachings it really hits and we can really say he did understand our pain he did understand our fears he did understand our anxieties and he did understand possibly even the frustration of lord you know yahweh lord you can do another way if you would so will it and even though I don't understand why you're wanting me to suffer, and even though I don't understand why you want me to be in pain and why you want me to be tortured when I'm, this is Yeshua thinking this possibly, that I'm the sinless one, like why, why, why do you want this? But then I believe truly that when Yeshua surrendered and of course when he rose again, he totally understood why. Obviously, right? And I think that that's a lesson for us. When we rise again, when we're with him in his kingdom, we will understand. But but it, it is okay for us to also live mi probably many parts of our life very frustrated and very full of anxiety in regards to God's will. Yeah, yeah. R rather than a, uh, you know, a compressed one night of totally conscious, like, I know where I'm going and I know what this means in the garden. Yeah. We may get a decades, life yeah, exactly. a lifetime of subtle confusions that drive us mad mad yeah <laughs> or sufferings or pains or illnesses you know all the above so yeah yeah anyways i hope that soapbox was okay to start off on and, and tie in the last video with you guys so thanks for listening <laughs> that was really really great so thank you for that um so we'll start with chapter we'll start back up with chapter 15 we got some general comments yeah 
David Miller Leslie says, just wanted to say, I love you guys. You're all amazing. We love you, David. And by y'all, I'm sure we're talking about the entire group here at EBRT and everybody else who's contributing and listening. And we love you guys. Um, Denise uh, writes, uh, I love EBRT. I learned so much from everyone's insights. Thank you all. And God bless you all. Indeed. Amen. God Amen. bless you all. Indeed. Yes. God bless you all. Thank you, everybody, for, for comments like that, too, by the way. Yes. Comments like that are very helpful and very... Uh, very very much a blessing we we love to hear the positive feedback or just confusion or anything so thank you guys yeah all right kicking it off chapter oh thematic yeah want me to read it gilda sure. during it? go for it yeah okay uh gilda foss uh general comment mark 15 uh during the questioning yeshua stayed silent and he took all those accusations upon himself for you and me Clearly, he wasn't going to say anything or do anything to attempt to get out of being crucified. After all, he was there to fulfill the will of the Father. But any other person would attempt to defend themselves and receive a different fate. Exactly. That is my that is my personal sorry, Gilda. That is my personal key to to where I am today is realizing that moment. Yeah. Yet the one person who could destroy everyone with the blink of his eye stayed a silent, obedient, surrendering son. Yeah. Furthermore, the whole thing with Barabbas was extremely deep for me, not because of the way the crowd chose or for the disbelief that Pilate had in the choice the people made, but it was deep for me because it illustrated that Yeshua literally, figuratively, spiritually, and eternally took the place of the murderer, the thief, the sinner in him. I am Barabbas, you are Barabbas, we're all Barabbas, and Yeshua willfully took his place up there on that cross so that we could eventually be with him forever. This level of grace and mercy demonstrated here is almost impossible to comprehend. Yep. What more significant form of love is there? Yep. Our own father paid our penalty for us out of his immense love and grace. There's nothing deeper and more significant than this that exists in the entire existence of the universe. I'm in agreement with you on that yep. one. <laughs> well said. Well said, Gilda. Thank you for that. Yeah. All That's right. probably why it has to be this way, guys. Because the ult like the the level of the perfection of the show of ultimate love that all of this is is un you can't imagine more. You can't actually imagine more. You can try and you will fail. You yeah. cannot imagine a greater show of love. No. I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. Ricardo, we got it. No worries, buddy. We got your comment. Yeah. It'll it'll come. Uh, so here we go. Jennifer Connolly, fifteen one, kicking us off. And straight away in the morning, the chief priests held a uh, consultation with the elders and scribes, and the whole council, and the whole council, and bound Yeshua and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. This makes me marvel at the length rulers will take to rebel against God's will and authority. They put all the rulers in place, and then those rules deteriorated to accomplish to accomplish man's will. I guess what I am reading is giving me a fixed feeling of injustice for the ways things went down in total rebellion, yet knowing that this is still the state of human conditions even today. I do give praise and thanks that he was able to turn this horrible thing around to accomplish this, the plans that were laid out before the beginning of time. Psalms 2-2, the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. I did look up the rules that were broken during the illegal trial below. One, timing. Yep. The trials took place at night instead of during daylight hours. Two, location. The trial was held in the house of the high priest Caiaphas rather than in the temple court. Three, proper witnesses. According to Jewish law, a capital trial required the testimony of reliable witnesses, but not here. There were issues with inconsistent and unreliable witnesses' testimonies. Four, warning to witnesses. Witnesses were supposed to be warned that making a false accusation could lead them uh, to receiving the same punishment accused would receive. There is no indication that this warning was given. Yep. Uh, five. Oh, uh, hmm. I wonder why they left that one out. 
Five, defense. Yeshua did not have a proper opportunity for a defense due to the rushed process. Six, physical abuse. He was struck and mistreated during the trial, which was contrary to principles of justice. Seven, hasty proceedings. The trial appeared rushed and lacked proper deliberation, and evidence of its conclusion is single in a, in a single night. Six, blasphemy as charge. Yeshua was charged with blasphemy for claiming to be the Son of God, but the interpretation of his statement as blasphemy was subjective and open to theological interpretation. Mm. Ricardo responds with Mark 15.1. For me, fits better as Mark 14.73 like it gives closure to Sanhedrin's trial. Jennifer Connelly, interesting, interesting result. Jennifer Connelly replies, interesting results or research on the fake trial. What struck me in reading through this whole process was the mockery of Yeshua that occurred throughout it. The mockery seems so out of character to me for people who are supposed to be godly leaders of the people. It just seems like a characteristic more reflective of the evil one, yet they couldn't see this. Very blind indeed. Perhaps I was to tell. Exactly. You know, the, 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 um, sorry, turning up here. Perhaps that was the, the tell that made it really obvious that Satan was running this whole show. Well, we... Because of the quality of the communication. <laughs> well, and it's interesting that Yeshua says, you are right, your father, the devil. You are of your father, the devil. And yeah. then when they have this trial, they are absolutely behaving and not as if God was their father, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, or even if Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses was their fathers, right? Like they weren't behaving in even the human way right so yeah yeah it's a pretty bad thing yeah and so the the other thing the fact that yeshua was kicked out of the tribes if you want to say i'm trying to word this in a easy way but during this process it's like it also is a very um yeah it's just very there's so much like there's so much depth to it i guess that's all i'll just stop there because we're going to get way more into it so all right it's a weird thing, though, for sure. The rock could cry out and he praises how much strength he had to hold back creation from saving him in order to prove point to us just thinking out loud. Yeah. Nice. Love you guys. Thanks for sharing the gospel. Praise Yeshua. Amen, Jake. Amen. Welcome. Blessed to be here with you. Yeah. All right. Um. Pretty... Uh, pretty, pretty awesome. Thanks, Jennifer, for that yeah. list. That was super clear. Yeah. Super great. Um, Mary, Mark 15, 3, Yeshua was completely surrendered to his fate, the destiny that his father had laid out for him. He fought the fight in the garden, and it was there that he apparently came to terms with it because he wasted no breath in useless arguments and sought no defense before his accusers. He had stopped fighting. The battle of his will had been won in the garden through prayer, struggle, and finally a submission of his will. Exactly. This is the same for us. We make a decision to surrender to God's will, submitting our own will and fate to him. And it's at that moment when we have won the battle that the re and, and the rest is just playing out the drama of the destiny that he has for us. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Sharon Lewis Roberts, Mark 15, verse 2 through 6. When I read these verses of how Yeshua responded, he was very minimal with his answers. Even Pilate was amazed that he did not defend himself more. I took this as an example of when you stand in truth, that you don't need to give more info than required. Plus, it reminds me of the advice given of future persecutions that Yeshua said to others in Matthew 10, verse 19 through 20. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For when you are to, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Exactly, Sharon. Exactly. No. Hallelujah. What a wonderful thing that will be. Indeed. Horrible experience, but <laughs> Oguchuku, um, Mark fifteen five. Yeshua yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Isn't that fascinating? After being accused by the elders, chiefs, and scribes, which is a great example of James one nineteen to twenty one. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and, superflu and su superflu 
super fluidy. Super, super. I'm glad this one's yours. Wow. Superfluous is the. I think that's word. the word is yeah. So maybe it was an autocorrect or something, or maybe it's right. And superfluous. It's, it's, it's just a weird. It might be mouthful. Elizabethan or something. Yeah, of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. I believe that Yeshua displayed in verses five through fifteen, and more so in the book of Matthew twenty-seven eleven through twenty-six was enough to convict Pontius Pilate into, unto salvation if ever he did repent. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mary says, Ogachukri, yes, on the first reading of this chapter, I noted in my Bible the wisdom of Yeshua in just keeping his mouth shut, not wasting his time in useless arguments. We all could probably learn a little something from this example, lol. <laughs> and Ogachukri said, most definitely. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Conley, 15.7. And there was one named Barbarus, which laid bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying out began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? It seemed to me that Pilate was trying to get out of making this final decision, because he knew the motives of envy, and thought for sure they would release the Son of God, the Father. With a little manipulation of the crowd, those chose they chose the son of the father and released Barbarus, son of the of the Abba. Uh, Genesis nineteen twelve, Barbarus. That's the definition she is giving. Uh, if you want to check out your Strong's, that's what that number stands for. The son of the father of rebellion, insurrection, and murder was released according to his name. That is, wow. Pilate knew it was was sin and washed his hands, but also covered himself with his blood and his children too mercy i did love this very important detail that was omitted in mark about the blood and the water matthew 27 24 when pilate saw that he could prevail nothing but that rather a tumult was made he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying i am innocent of the blood of this just person ye see to it and then answered all the people and said his blood be upon us and our children and that is going to be a fun conversation when we get there. <laughs> right? Looking forward to that one, aren't you? Mm. <laughs> yes, very, very good. Suzanne Davis, uh, Mark 15, 11. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him released for the, to have released for them Barabbas instead. The chief priests back then were not so different from some church leaders today. The reason why we need to stay in the word um the reason why we need to stay in the word which so easy to be led us because we're so easy to be led astray by false church churches otherwise jehovah never changes mm. he's the same today as yesterday and will be the same in the future and when yeshua returns i noticed that yeshua died on the cross at 3 p.m the number three seems to be symbolic in yeshua's crucifixion conquering death and rebuilding the temple the father son holy spirit the Father was the first, then Yeshua, then the Holy Spirit. None exists without the other. It is possible, is it possible that Yeshua dying on the cross at 3 p.m. is symbolic of the beginning and the end? Yehovah coming around full circle. Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the, Lord, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Isaiah 16.10, declaring the end from the Isaiah beginning. Isaiah 46.10. Wow. I meant to say that. Thank you. Isaiah 46, 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established <laughs> and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. <laughs> I love when God speaks like that. Yeah. Because you're just like, that's it. It's done. Yeah. Ain't, ain't no going back now. <laughs> <laughs> he said it will be, so it is. Yeah. Amen, sister. Thanks for that great comment. Yeah. Appreciate that very much. Uh, Vicky, Mark 15, 15. So Pilate washing to satisfy the crowd, excuse me, wishing to satisfy the crowd, re released for them Barbarus and having scourged Yeshua, he delivered him to be crucified. The first person, man, what is wrong with us today? The first part of the verse stood out to me. Pilate was wishing to satisfy the crowd 
not to do what was right. There is a lot of this going on today. People doing and saying things just to justify the crowd. You could change someone's life if you just decided to please God instead of man. This verse came to mind. Galatians 1.10 For I... For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Exactly. Mm. And... And I think it's important, though, you know, and I'm not saying anything to you, Vicky. I just I just like to say this when any time this kind of conversation gets brought up about Pilate specifically is, you know, he he was already being threatened by Caesar that if he had any type of uproar, he and his wife and his family were going to get, you know, kicked out and potentially even killed as well. So because he was having so much problems with the Jews. So they were that much of a problem for, for Rome, right? Uh, which will lead to the 70 AD war, actually. The exact same thing Pilate is having an issue with. So what I'm saying is, too, is that, you know, for all of us, uh, when we come to that crossroad in our life where it's, we think like, okay, God, but I mean, what's in front of me is such an intense, if I, if I speak up and say the right thing or do the right thing, it is so much destruction and mayhem that will domino from that. That can't be your will for me. Right. And I perceive that Pilate was going through the same thing. Like I either kill this guy or I allow them technically to kill this guy. Right. And then, and then this whole thing can just go away. Right. Like everything can be smoothed out and life goes back to normal. And I think like it's that, that reality when you're in it seems not only logical, but it seems loving. You're loving on your family, you're protecting them, you're loving on your wife, you're protecting her, you're loving on your people you might be in charge of because you think you're a good leader, a loving leader, which I think Pilate thought of himself as. You know what I mean? Like, it, I just I just think that when, if and when we should ever get to a stage in our life, we're making a decision that's for God, like you said, or speaking the truth that's for God could just cause such catastrophe it will be much harder for us to do that than I think we think. Because we realize that if we speak the truth, a catastrophe truly is coming. And we might even say to ourselves, how can God want me to speak this truth? Like, does God really need me? Does he have that kind of ego that he needs me to speak this truth and cause this kind of chaos to domino? And I think that when we get to that crossroad, or if we should ever have that moment in our life, I think that we need to be okay with the choice we make god willing hopefully it is we speak the truth of god but we need to understand that you know as it did with daniel daniel is a great great example right caused absolute mayhem but look at how much god was able to bring his glory and show his glory to the entire world technically at that time because it was just that community right like because there was few who were willing to allow the chaos and the destruction and the death to even unfold, God was able to demonstrate his absolute glory. And I, and, I, and I think that that's another time when our faith will be tested. What will God really sh show up for me? I'm not Daniel. I'm not Isaiah. I'm not Ezekiel. I'm not Moses. Like, is he going to, I'm not that. I'm, you know, he's probably not going to show up. So I'll just, I'll just go with the flow. I'll just agree. I'll just bite my tongue. You know, that kind of thing. I think it's just really easy. I, I just like to point out the reality of it myself because that's how I, I hopefully encourage myself to stay strong in that regard. That makes sense. I, you know, it's, I agree 100% that Pilot was in, in self and family and social order preservation mode, first and foremost. Which would we blame anybody for? Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, no. Um, Jennifer Connolly, uh, March, March, Mark. <laughs> Is that M A R? That's March. Yeah. March fifteenth. Be well. The March fifteenth. Twenty first hour. Yes. Uh, take two. Take fifty seven. Mark fifteen. Verse twenty one. That's what that is. Mm. And they compel one Simon a Cyre a Cyrenian who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. They always portray Simon in the movies as not wanting to bear the cross, so they whip him and make him do the, do 
that, but doesn't really say that here. It didn't say much about the sons mentioned, but he, they may have been known by Mark. Simon of Serene was an outsider, a passerby from Serene in North Africa. It went on to say salvation and redemption through Yeshua is open to people from all walks of life, regardless of their background, and, and was symbolic of a future call to discipleship. Just like Simon, we're, we are to take up the... Take up... Yep, take up our cross. Our. Okay, that's our. Take up our cross and follow Yeshua, Yeshua's example, in a life of devotion, service, and self-sacrifice. 1 Peter 2.21... For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. <laughs> Bam. Good quote there, Jennifer. Good tie-in, for sure. Yeah. Mary. Rainey, Mark fifteen thirty three. While on the cross in the ninth hour, at the peak of his suffering, he calls out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We will do the same in our own hour of trial and suffering. He doesn't even call out to him as father as he normally referred to him, just as the Greek word for the, for God, Theos, which is uh, an impersonal deity. I feel that he feels so alone and forsaken here. Uh, Sharon L Lewis Roberts replies, You made me think about this. Does this mean he was completely separated from himself when he cried out? And maybe the reason he said God instead of father at the moment was because of the separation. Maybe he became a vessel taking on all of our sins, which had been transferred to him, and the Father could not reside in him at that time, so he felt that anguish. This is just some thoughts I had on this. That, just to chime in, that's exactly what I'm persuaded of. I'm persuaded that at that moment... He was like the scapegoat. He was like the scapegoat, and he... Yeah, exactly. And he was... I believe he actually felt... As the sep he felt the distance like God was not with him inside wise right like yeah. like that I think was separated and that's why he said why have you forsaken me I, I that's there's a lot to that but I am persuaded of that myself Mary or Sharon so yeah you want to keep reading yeah um well is it can, mine yeah you can read these comments oh, okay pertaining to this uh so then exactly totally agree oh yeah mary says exactly totally agree then dina says i thought exactly the same shabathi shabathani uh translates to thou hast left me see with an awful feeling that must have been especially considering he had always felt his father's presence up to that point exactly yeah. Uh, Sharon says, Mark 13, 39, the centurion statement is quite a big one. I'm taking it that he received Yeshua as the Messiah, the first Gentile to receive salvation. The enemy was defeated upon his last breath as the first seeds are already cast. Yeah. And the language he's speaking here is Aramaic, which is basically equivalent of like speaking kind of English today in that it was the global language at the time. It was a language that like everybody spoke. So that I think that's interesting too, that of all the languages that the Messiah spoke last, it was the most common of languages that more people would understand it than another language. So I think that also says something about Yeshua here as well. And it, it's one of the, also the reasons that I became persuaded early on in my belief that the name is Yeshua and not Yehoshua. Because Yeshua is of more of the Aramaic, uh, like slang or casual name that they would have used at that time, and so since he speaks this way, at this moment, and Bible tells us, or there's other things that tell us that he spoke that they spoke this at the time as well, uh, that I'm persuaded that the name is actually Yeshua that they would have called him. So it just ties in with this. That's why I thought I'd mention it. What you thinking? You hear your gears turning. Oh, they're turning. Woo! But I'm not sure they're ready. Okay. 
Well, should we read on then? Yeah. Maybe it'll brew. Well, I'm not sure they're ready yet at all. Oh, I see. It's 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 a serious gem that I'm stuffing in my pocket right now. Um. Yeah, let's continue. This is the this is actually the last comment. It's yeah, just, it's just, oh no, it's not. Oh no, no, it's just a very long one. Yeah, it's Ricardo. Yeah, Ricardo, we got well, you. Let me, oh, let me. uh We have another one here. Let me uh take a big long breath. It's one of Ricardo's. Oh, uh, Ricardo, actually, real time comment hung in a tree, it says, and cross in Greek is stauros, stauros, meaning a pole. Maybe Yeshua was not carrying a cross, but a pole. And this Simon man did not carry the cross technically, but carried Yeshua, who was attached to that pole already. Um, read somewhere that if it is a pole, it was probably a platybulum that big piece of rectangular wood that blocks big doors back then with a pole in the middle and in that hole was the tip of the tree inserted to make the cross okay could be yeah and suzanne davis says maybe and it is actually the tree of knowledge of good and evil like the actual wood itself maybe is from that tree. Mm. Who knows? Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, guys. That was like the lamest uh, cliffhanger of all time, but I, it, I'm i really not ready to talk about it. I'm sure of it, but... Hey, your um, teeth? You, yeah. You told it, you're like, was, I have something, but I'm not going to talk about super it. Super dumb, super dumb. But one day. Um, Rick... <laughs> I'm so good at this. Ricardo, Mark 15 through 35 through 30, 34 through 35. And at the ninth hour, Yeshua cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, behold, he calleth Elijah. Like in Matthew, this is re this I read many, many times, and I always wondered if Holy Ghost left Yeshua by this point for a reason, and had a few conjectures about it, but not one seemed right. And thanks to Strong's concordances, and having the original language meaning, cleared it up a little bit for me. Damn. Matthew mentions the same situation, but uses the word Eli mm -hmm. instead of the word Eloi, Eloi yeah. as Mark did. Both words seem to be in a different dialect, but both words have the same root origin, the word El, which indeed refers to God the Almighty. Makes sense the people standing there may, mis may have misheard Yeshua and thought he was calling Elijah, which, which name is the conjunction of the words El and Yah. What, that, what kind of surprised me is that people who heard him totally missed the reference, but then I realized I missed it too. By this point, Yeshua is, on a ter is, in, is in terrible pain despite all the punishment he received before being crucified, beaten, mocked, there are many nerves in the wrists and upper part of the feet. The pain he must have been feeling had to be only bearable by the strength of the Holy Ghost, for even at this point. Yeshua here, as I read all this, feels like he was not complaining or felt forsaken, but actually quoting a psalm, right. a song that talks about him in this precise moment. Yeah. I think that this was the reason for Matthew and Mark, for Matthew and Mark clarified, what was the interpretation of the sentence? I think they got the reference. Yeshua at the cross having an excruciating pain, quote of scripture, Psalm 22. This feels like a reply to all who were standing there mocking him. Mm -hmm. When I was in my late 20s, I had a group of friends who used to hang out and have strong experiences. We had this inner joke that only us will get. When some of us was beginning to feel dizzy or way too drunk, used to say, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. And we all knew the reference right there, and we'd laugh. But anyone who were listening probably won't understand what we were talking about. Yes, we used a quote from Wizard of Oz. Uh, we'd understand, Ricardo. Um, reading, Yeshua's, uh, reading Yeshua, quoting Psalm 22, reminded me of that memory of mine, and made me think that Yeshua said that precise line, pretty much the whole Psalm 22 prophesies about him. Here are a few extracts from Psalm 22. I wrote in parentheses that I felt what I felt while reading the psalm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? 
Here the word helping is H3444, which is Yeshua. I reread the sentence, Why art thou so far from me, Yeshua, and from the words of my roaring? Wow. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Um, it felt to me like a direct reference to how much Yeshua must have been beaten and hurt, probably totally covered in blood, totally unrecognizable and hurt. It made me cry. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let deliver. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. This matches 100% with the mocking on the cross when the people said to Yeshua, If you are the Messiah, save yourself. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Total reference to Mary's encounter with an angel and what was going to happen. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Mm. Yeshua was alone on the cross. Um, many bulls have come past me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening, ravening and roaring lion. This felt like a reference to the Roman soldiers who beat Yeshua. Warning, the next verses of Psalm 22 are very sad, but they match perfectly with Yeshua's experience. I am poured out like water, totally bled out, and all of my bones are out of joint due to the weight of his own body hanging. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength has dried up like a pot's herd. Like a pot's herd. Um, my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, probably due to thirst. Mm. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. This is so sad. Mm. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots in my vesture. In fact, Roman soldiers did cast lots for his clothing. The following final sentences are quite epic because they clearly prophesy Yeshua. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord's for a generation." They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto the people, unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. As I wrote before, after reading this, for me, when Yeshua said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, here Yeshua was in terrible pain, despite all the punishment he received before being crucified, beaten, mocked, and there are many nerves in the, yes, um, many nerves in the rest in the upper parts of the people. The pain he must have been feeling had to only be bearable by the strength of the Holy Ghost, um, for even at this point, Yeshua seems to not be complaining or feeling forsaken, but actually quoting a psalm, a song that talks about him in the precise moment. And to finish this lengthy comment, <laughs> I found another psalm that seems to confirm all of this. Let me know what you think. This is Psalm 42, 8 through 11. It says, Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. Short info, Yeshua said, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, at the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. But from 12 p.m., the sixth hour, darkness covered the land, making technically night. But there's more. The word night here in Hebrew means properly a twist, a way of the light. Um, that is night, but also figuratively adversity, which for me, describes the very moment of this situation. Sorry, to continue. Um, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, where is my God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the who's the health of my countenance and my God. 
Wow, right? Seems to confirm that Yeshua was not feeling forgotten. Feels like he was fulfilling again a prophecy. Exactly. Last, I promise, last sentence, who is the health of my countenance and my God? In Hebrew, God is Elohim. Countenance is panim, which means face. And health is, drumroll please, yes, H3444, Yeshua. I read the sentence as I shall praise him who is Yeshua, the face of Elohim. I'm dropping the mouse because you know what I just, you know, I just can't help myself in this particular moment because wow. Yeah. Good work, Ricardo. You you did good. You did a long one, but you worked it out. It was really, really well done and said. Thank you so much, brother. Yeah. And yes, I, I am persuaded myself that, you know, he, he said what he said on the cross because it was the final... Uh, thing for him to do to fulfill all the prophecies of the Messiah. He he had to say it out loud. But um I don't I, I do think it was a form of controlled folly, but I uh, in the fact that he knew he had to say it, but I do feel that he felt what we potentially feel when we feel the absence of God. I I, I don't I, I I there's no way for me to know that. I just the absence of God is hell. And because it says he took on our sins, he took upon him his sins, the scriptures will tell us that, then there's that separation between him and the Father. And, you know, in that brief one minute that we had with the Moses thing, it was, it was like the scariest absolute moment. And if I even dared allow my brain to role play an eternity of that, it would truly be the definition of hell for me. You know, so, you know, for somebody who actually is Jehovah in flesh and the face of Elohim, yeah, I, I can't imagine what kind of experience that would be. I can't, I can't even role play that because, like, it's too high and great of a thing, right? I hope I'm even making sense. This is not an easy thing to talk about because we're talking about the unfathomable... This is experience this is the of the Messiah himself, right? This is, so. the this is the gem. This is the gem that I got, but I know it's incomplete because I am in agreement with you that it is indeed Jehovah in flesh. Yeah. But we think about it in a we usually that just means to us, okay, it's it's an avatar and inside is the fullness of God just go and I'm pretending. Right. For your sakes, you guys. And sometimes it reads that way. And sometimes the things Yeshua says, you're like, aha, there, there it is. is. Yeah. He's letting us know. Yeah. But I feel like today I got this glimpse of like, wait, hold on. He is the sacrificial lamb. There is like a full on being here. Yes. That is both totally with the father and actually separate from the father. And yet somehow when the father speaks through him in the ways that he does, yeah. it is I, it is indistinguishable who's who. Yeah. It isn't even important. Yeah. And that's my that's I think the gem I want to talk about and since you're bringing this up again I'm going to talk about it real quick. The point of it being indistinguishable that's like that moment I know that I believe I feel that there is moments that I have experienced like that when the Holy Spirit hits you you forget that there's like a separation between you and it. If that makes sense. Like there's, there are moments where suddenly you have thoughts that completely feel like they came from, they're just thoughts you're having, but they're, you know, they're not yours. <laughs> but at the same time, when you, if you ever act on them and speak on them and anybody looks at you and everybody, anybody hears you, they, they can only see that they must be your thoughts because they see you. Mm. So like, my point is that like the, dis the, the distinguishment from trying to, trying to figure out where does the son end and the father begin mm -hmm. is like unimportant even even maybe to god himself and that might be the whole point of the whole thing of how much he wants us to be with him that we're not like that ultimately in our truest form we are not really separated from god there isn't a where do i stop and he begin we are in it's like in an indistinguishable thing I don't know if that makes sense what I said. That's like a thing that I'm a notion I'm trying to I think that's the I think that's kind of the point. Cuz I know I've you know, what was that phrase we used? Mm. I said Your my brain, brain is runs, running into itself. Circles around runs into itself. Trying to figure out the parameters 
of some of these paradoxes, of some of these mysteries, including this one specifically, like, okay, so Yeshua is the thing, and then God shows up and, like, goes inside him, and things happen, like, so, uh, we're so, we get so hung up on finding the borders, the boundaries of this experience. What if the whole point is not to have the boundaries? Should watch this video series called the 48 day holiness challenge yeah so <laughs> <laughs> you'll like it a lot i promise I'm so <laughs> that i i like that i it's funny because like paul talks about the confusion of this and i love it he addresses the fact that like it's the mystery of christ he calls it the mystery of christ how can he be 100 percent man and 100 percent god right and yeah, I think that God desires us to be 100% in uniform with him. But how does that happen? There is obviously clearly a difference when sin is involved. Sin does separate from God. Yes. Right? But if we can remove the sin, like if if we can move remove the sin, then we do indeed enter into a, an ability to actually be flowing in a relationship with Jehovah, according to Christ's own words, as Yeshua himself is in Jehovah and as Jehovah is in Christ. Which is like, right now is the appropriate time to like meditate on that promise that Yeshua says, because we're really fathoming and we're really delving our brains in this conversation right now about how much Jehovah was in Yeshua, how much Yeshua was in Jehovah, Okay, the sin separated him on the cross. That must have been an absolute hell we probably and thankfully won't ever truly understand, especially if we get to go to heaven, you know, and be there with him forever. But then also the whole the whole thing of like, but wait, you're at, there's actually a way and there's actually like a formula and a path that actually allows us in this life to be in a flow with God as it was with Yeshua, as it was, not in a simulated way, right. but not, as it was with God. Not in, a, with Yeshua. It, not, ah. in a, not in a diluted way where Correct. first Yeshua, then you. Right. Not in a, like, in actual. Well, yes, first Yeshua, then you. That is actually correct because Yeshua says that. I am the first brother of many. No, no, I'm saying, like, when you experience, the experience is available to experience it as Yeshua experienced it. Not where uh, you're getting a like some sub form, some subset. Yeah, you're not. Yeah, that's you're getting I'm you're getting yes. the purity in which is he, the first to to right. experience it. Yeah, the point is you can have the same purity of experience as he had. You can, yes, because so this is this is this is where. So the, if you have the same purity of experience as he had, yeah, then that feeling of being one with the Father that he speaks of, yes, is available to you. Which means, yes, what does that mean? That means that that whole distinction of who is the son, who isn't the son, all of the stuff that the, the, it, it becomes, it, it's, it's, it fades away. There is, there is, you know what I'm saying? So if, if, if each one of us could experience the same oneness with the father as Yeshua did, then does it really, at that point, does it really matter for us to start to, to continue to trip on the mysteries of well where does the son stop and the father begin and who is the father and what's the is there three things is there three people the father the son and the holy ghost like who do i pray to you know what i'm saying like all of it just becomes completely silly yeah it yeah. does yeah yeah so ricardo has a comment that ties in with what's being said we can't remove sin we can surrender to him and let his spirit guide us and change us through his correction, right? His spirit allows us to, to do the pause and make the choice. Uh, Mary says, I believe this is what Enoch was doing, walking perfectly with the Lord. So, Ricardo, it's a moment-to-moment -moment experience, but you have to go through the refining fire. So, here's here's just my, my understanding, and as we will read scripture, so I'm just going to throw it out there. My understanding is that we will never actually be perfect. However, because we can receive, surrender, and, and, and believe on the cross, we can actually have the blood of Christ cover us. So imagine a vase or a bucket, okay? 
And that bucket or that vase is completely covered in Christ's blood. Completely. There is not a molecule that's not covered in Christ's blood. When God looks down, if you will, on that bucket, he sees no sin. Because the blood of Christ is perfect and sinless. So because it covers the bucket, God actually sees the bucket finally as a, bu a bucket or a vessel worthy to carry his spirit. So when we receive the covering of Christ's blood and we believe on the cross and the resurrection, we, we invoke the promise that Yeshua spoke, which is cosmic law, as I call it, right? And because Yeshua spoke to the Father on our behalf and requested this on our behalf, it is so. Not because we do anything, but because Christ himself said, this is what I want, and I, he's allowed to have it because of one, who he is, but two, because he died on the cross willingly and rose again. So we are actually able to do this. Again, it's a free gift from Christ. When we get washed by the blood, as it's called, we get seen clean and pure as snow in God's eyes, meaning he only sees Christ's blood. He then has the ability because the sin has been separated. Now God can put the, the Holy Spirit, the same exact dose that was in Christ, the same exact Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh that was literally in Christ, can now go into us because we are completely and utterly covered by Yeshua, by Yeshua's blood. When that enters into us and we continue to surrender it moment, moment to moment, we are actually now no longer operating and we move into the sentence that Paul says, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. For that which is my flesh has been died and is dead and died on the cross with Christ. And in our surrender, we kill the flesh. And now that the Holy Spirit is in us, if we moment to moment to moment choose to surrender to the Holy Spirit living in us, we are no longer acting in the world. We are no longer making choices in the world. We are no longer allowing our thoughts and our desires to control any part of our being. And at that moment, if we can, even just for a millisecond, if we can operate for a millisecond in that way, we are technically getting to experience what it was like for the Holy Spirit to reside in Christ. And Christ had to come and he had to cover us because otherwise God could never enter into us. He could never give us that dose. He could never puppeteer us, if you will. So Christ had to die so that we could be puppeteered that way. But, but in order for us to be puppeteered that way, we not only have to understand that it is his blood that covers us that makes us worthy vessels, not our doing, but we also have to know his commandments. And when an opportunity in our walk or in our breath or in our thoughts or in our minds of the day come, that's why in the 40 Day Holiness Challenge, I call it moment to moment to moment. When that comes, we must choose what he commanded us to choose. So there are right choices to make. And if we don't make the right choice, what we what we do is we technically take like a spatula, if you will, and we scrape off a piece of the blood or a part of the blood off of the bucket. And now we've moved back into being us. And so now God has to leave. So we have to reinvoke. We have to get right by God. We have to be refined again by the Father, be covered by the blood again, and then the Holy Spirit comes back into us. And then if we make a choice that is ours, then we're scraping off the blood again. Because the only good, just as Yeshua himself gave as an example, he says, why do you call me good? There is none who is good, but one who is the Father. So that means that even Yeshua acknowledges that any choice that he, Yeshua, would have made, it would have been not good. But because he tells us in Scripture, I do only that which my Father wills. He only does. It means he never made a choice and never did a thing that was outside of God's will, which means the bucket was never scraped because he was the bucket. He was the blood, right? He was it. So, but that's the analogy that I can best give that that's how it works. Like that's why we have the vernacular we have in Christianese washed clean by the blood, covered by the blood, you know, um, the Holy Spirit enters into us. Yeshua says, it is good that I go to the Father because if I don't go to the Father, I cannot send the helper. And then he says, I will send the helper. I will come and help you. So that's why when, so that ties in with why Paul says, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. 
some believers might think that Paul is speaking inaccurately and should be saying, it is no longer I who lives, but the Holy Spirit that lives in me. But Yeshua clearly said on the last night, which we read in the Gospel of John, I'm going to go to the Father, and then I will send you the Helper, the Holy Ghost. And then he says, I will come and I will help you. So once we understand that Yeshua is Yahweh, the Holy Spirit is Yahweh, and when Yeshua comes and enters into us, the Holy Spirit comes and enters into us. So the blood covers us and washes us clean so that we ourselves can receive God, which is Yahweh is our salvation. Right. It's just like it's all like you. So what you just said is completely correct, because once you actually have that experience, you realize that you aren't talking to separate deities. You are no. talking to the exact same spirit individual, if you will, and that he who walked in Christ and, and puppeteered Christ is the same one who is now in you and wants to puppeteer you. The only problem is, is humans just never want to surrender to that will. We just don't want to surrender. There's certain things in our life we just want to take back. And every time we take back, we're scraping the blood off the bucket and we enter back into the world and we enter back into ourselves and God's separated from us to some degree. You see what I'm saying? It's a, it's a, it's a delicate dance. Vicky's asking the question, so you think when we sin, the Holy Spirit leaves us? in the way that it can be with us if we are surrendered completely to the Lord. It, it, I don't want to say that it leaves us like, if the Holy Spirit, can I say that Alex is, has left the room? No. But if Alex had somehow the ability to put his hand inside my hand and move my fingers, then I would say Alex is, you know, Alex is like with me. But then if, Alex, if I do something that causes Alex to take his hand out and stop puppeteering my hand, I would say that Alex is no longer with me. However, he's still here. So he's still in the room with me, right? I can still hear him. I can still feel him. I can still call him. I can still pray to him. I can still have that kind of relationship. And I think that most believers have that kind of relationship and they think that they've achieved it. They think that if they raise their hands and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I believe that he died on the cross. I sing these songs. I go to church on Sunday. I tithe. I do all these check marks. And it's clear because look, God's in the room with me. But I do believe that, that Yeshua is crystal clear that that's not where it's supposed to stop. I believe that Paul is a great, hum, more human experience and, and teacher for us because he, because he gets to the point where he says, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. The flesh and, and who I was before is dead. And then, and then right as he's going to get his head chopped off, he says, I've done it. I've run the good race. Nobody has anything against me which tells me that he sustained that ability. And it's an interesting thing when you take the passage specifically where Christ said, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you eventually. So right now, if you haven't experienced a state where you stayed in God long enough, you stayed covered by the blood long enough and, and walked with God and surrendered to God long enough to actually experience Satan fleeing from you, right? Most of us, we, we it's so hard to even fathom surrendering to one moment to God's will authentically and truly, right? That we can't even fathom the idea that we've got, we've, we, we did it so long or we've gone so long that the devil realizes I need to stay away from this one. God's with him. I got to get out of Dodge. I can't, I can't play around with this one. Right. And, and I think that for some of us, we hear sentences like that and we think they're just either poetry or they're just so far away from the place in which we're at that we just allow our minds to go, well, that's just not for me, or I just don't understand that. So God's just going to have to accept me as I am, or I'm just going to deal with that when I get to heaven. And we, and I believe that we are missing out on what the whole reason why Christ died. Like if, if all he wanted was for us to have God in the room with us, he just would have kept the temple going. But God says, I am a jealous God. And then he says, I will no longer put myself in a building. I will put myself in each one of them individually. Like this is God's ambition stated in scripture. God doesn't say, I'm going to create another universe. I'm going to create a prettier planet. I'm going to create healthier water and healthier food. I'm going to create people with better hearts and genius minds. He says, I am going to reside in them. I'm going to write my laws in their heart. And they are going to be my people, my children, and I am going to be their God. I am going to be their father, even the Gentile. This is God's ambition for the reason for everything. So when Christ dies on the cross and that blood spills and we're able to be washed by it and we're resurrected again, 
it's so that we can have that level of relationship. So when we live our lives not to that caliber, we, in my opinion, my humble opinion, which I've stated before, especially in the 40-day holiness challenge, I believe we are actually in a way spitting in, in Christ's face and saying, listen, he died on the cross. I raised my hands. I thank you for it. You saved me. And now I'm going to go live in the world. And and it's a really rough, it's a really rough thing for us to really sit with because we fight with, I think, two things, and I'm soapboxing here, I guess. We fight with two things, right? We fight with one, well, what's the reality that I could ever get to that point? And I honestly believe that this is where the turmoil of Christendom and the entire world exists. There are so few people who understand that Christ's blood will indeed fully cover us to the point where indeed the Ruach HaKodesh will actually live in us and guide us and puppeteer us, that the world has not seen it and therefore not believed in it. Which leads back to the conversation where I apologize to you because I said you've never seen me my you, you never seen me walk in that way though i have walked in that way in my past you've never seen me walk and demonstrate that level of of walk so i've done you wrong right so i've done every anybody anybody in my world wrong because i know that i have walked that way before and then i chose to get out of it because the world attacked me for it because the devil attacked me for it and i and i surrendered to that i broke i broke down to it and i said i i can't handle this cross like, I, I wasn't Yeshua and said, but not my will, your will. When I got attacked, when I had the cross, when I was getting persecuted, which is like what happened after God's chosen men, I was like, nope, I need, I need a breath of, I need a breath of, I need a, I need a moment of peace. And what, what what's strange, and I believe anybody watching this video might be able to hear, like, vibe with me on this or, or feel me on this. This is a totally backwards, but this is how the devil works. This is how our flesh works. I had the conversation in my heart and in my mind, Lord, being covered by the blood of Yeshua and being filled with the Holy Spirit is so wonderful and so pure and so strong and it's so amazing and miracles are happening every which way. You're talking to me 24-7, moving in me 24-7, it's great. But then I got attacked for it because the devil wanted to stop that. And I was like, I and the attack was so brutal that I didn't have the stamina to withstand it to the point where finally Satan left me, I broke first and I go, I need to sin. And I know it's going to kick you out of my bucket, God, but this is too brutal for me. So I made a conscious choice. It wasn't a subconscious choice. It was an absolutely conscious choice to intentionally sin. I actually had to work to sin because I had been walking with him in such a way where like sin was like so... Sin was not something that I had to fight to resist. It was something I had to fight not to want to like smash it and kill it and rebuke it and and like invoke God and bless it and all that kind of stuff. Like it was the, I was walking in a way where like it was the exact opposite. But when the attacks happened on my life, my rent was taken, my friends were taken, my position in church was taken, my health was taken. And I was just like, I like I have nothing. I'm homeless. Not even Christians stayed with me. Not even I'm being falsely accused. Like all the things that like to a small, tiny degree of what Christ was experiencing caused me to go, I need to sin so that Satan will leave me alone because I can't handle another day of this. And then I, I intentionally chose to sin and and then walk 50-50, basically. Like, one day I'll walk clean, and I'll try to strike, be good with the Lord, and I'll invite the Lord in when I feel like, you know, everything is okay. And then if things got too holy, and I got attacked too much, I'd go back into sin, or I'd go back into my sinful ways, so that it, the attack would stop. And, like, this, I think, is the reality for a lot of people. Maybe people out there listening to this are like, wow, this guy is crazy. This doesn't make any sense. Nobody would do that. This isn't real. But I'm giving you a totally honest testimony here, and that's what I was told to do. And I believe that to a degree, we either all pick up the bottle, we would have a drink when we know we shouldn't, we have a smoke when we know we shouldn't, we say a curse word when we know we shouldn't, um, we we watch a thing that we know we shouldn't, we look at a thing or lust in our heart and our mind or get jealous when we know we shouldn't. I think that microscope, I think like on a, on a subconscious micro scale, I believe that what we all do is we choose to sin to stop the pain, not realizing that if we could sustain and push through the pain, it is the devil who would eventually flee from us. And I can't give a testimony at this day and age in my life of how long that takes. 
but i'll tell you that for me it was longer than i could sustain and i was by myself i had no fellowship i had nobody with me and that matches also with what scripture says he says that i send you out as sheep among the wolves you will be persecuted you will be you will be killed for my namesake and I felt totally persecuted, and I felt like I was being killed for his namesake, but I felt like I wasn't an apostle. I felt like I wasn't glorious. I felt like there was no good being done of it. Nobody's going to ever read about me in a book called the Bible. So I was like, I convinced myself that there's no point for me to be this holy. Like, there's no point for me to do this. But of course, there is a point, because if you don't allow, if you don't keep pushing, you don't get to see how much more God can do. And if you make that choice, you're really spitting in Yeshua's face. You're really saying, sorry, Yeshua, what you did on the cross, that's nice and all, but you know, I, I still need I need I need my cake to eat it too. Right? It's it's a really, really bad thing. And anyways, I talk more about this in the 40 Day Holiness Challenge, of course. You guys have seen that. But I hope that this little testimony here speaks to you guys a little bit. And maybe, you know, and maybe you have a different experience than me, but that is that is my experience. And that and I can testify that you can indeed have the Holy Ghost in you and you can indeed surrender moment to moment to moment to the Holy Ghost and it will no longer be you living in the world. But the only choice we as human beings are making at that point is that we're not making a choice of our own, that we're just surrendering to God. It's, it, and it starts with brief little minutes at a time, but you can, you, your muscle gets stronger and those, the moments get longer and longer and longer. So that's my testimony tonight. That's awesome. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Now, hopefully we can all get, get on that horse and ride and uh, have success. I, I myself want to get back there and and uh, I testified about it a couple of video go, uh, videos ago and I've been working on it and uh, things have gotten better, crazy enough. So I don't know. You know? Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. Yeah, it's... Wow. Yeah, David Miller. I remember screaming at him in my desert. Why are you still with me? I was like, if he left, I could get back to normal. But now I don't even remember normal. Yeah, that's the other thing is once you taste that experience, the world loses its flavor, right? Like you, 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 you can't go. You can't go back. And the Bible uses a, a an analogy or a phrase or or saying, it's like a dog returning to its vomit. Because that's what it's like. Once you experience the goodness of God and you realize how real the thing I just kind of described is, like it's so real and it's absolutely something that not only we can experience here, but Christ literally commands it. You realize, like, it is like, why am I returning to my vomited life? Why am I returning to my disease, disgusting life? But it's like the flesh, exactly like what Christ also says to Peter, right? The flesh is weak, the spirit is strong, or vice versa. I always mess those up. But you guys get what I'm saying. Yeah. Amazing, man. All right. Amazing. Um, Okuchuku, Mark 15, 37 through 38. And Yeshua cried out with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. No more sacrifices. Yeshua is the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah. Um, I'll read the yeah. next one here. And, the, and that's another thing. That only kind of proves the point even more. Of all the things that happen, why was the veil ripped? Right. It's proven the point. Yeah. Because Christ, God says in the Old Testament, I will no longer be in a building. I will be in them. And then upon Christ's death, the veil rips. Yeah. So he can no longer be held the in The kingdom there. of heaven is at hand. Yeah. Upon that moment, God takes back the kingdom. Exactly. And that's when it's completed that Yeshua has actually defeated. And now God gets everything back. He gets he gets it all back the way he he wants it and now he's made it so that there is no other priest that goes into a building there's no more animal sacrifices it's yeshua is the last of it and now we just eternally can receive yeshua we can eternally come back to him we can eternally surrender again back to him and and, and get right with him you know which is it, it's so easy to say but wow holy criminy impossible to 
fathom even what let a, alone what do a, what a like ridiculously br brilliant choreography yeah this is, this is the thing that you know i mean we, we say i think i say this every video anybody who thinks the bible was written by dudes couldn't be more wrong no um mary rainey mark fifteen forty two. this verse is speaking about the day when yeshua died now when evening had come because it was on the preparation day that is the day before the sabbath this means that he died on thursday not friday the good friday holiday celebrated by the orthodox church makes no sense yeshua died on thursday and spent three nights in the tomb thursday friday and saturday night and he was discovered as risen on sunday the first day of the week this is simple math. Well, at least I'm persuaded that's how the math works. Yeah, I remember looking into this, Mary, and there's a day of preparation before the Sabbath. But there's two Sabbaths. There's the Passover Sabbath, right. and then there's the Sabbath Sabbath. And the way that week ran, the Passover Sabbath may have come on just like you say, the Friday or something. So, yeah, there was the. That's why there was one. There was the day before the. Yeah. Please look this up to be more specific. I remember finding this more specifically on the internet. I, my memory doesn't serve me right now, but there is two Sabbaths around the time of Yeshua's um, crucifixion and, and resurrection. And um, basically, I think the timeline you are putting down works. Um, and yes, the idea of Good Friday, actually, and then Sunday, yeah, that does, that's not really, it's not really happening time timeline wise um so good good thank you for the research there's um yes he had to be in the grave for three nights counting back from sunday that's thursday yeah but there's actually like a um i remember seeing an article online where they they look at roughly the dates and the years of roughly around the time where the crucifixion might have occurred. I think it's 8033 or something like that. And, um, or 8030 possibly. And there's, uh, there's a week where Passover would have fallen that completely meets this criteria where really it was Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Mm. And then, um, you know, by Sunday morning, the tomb is open and he's, and he's resurrected. And so, uh, final comment here for this week from Leo, Leo Levo, Mark 14, uh, 15, 43. Joseph is claiming the body of Yeshua. So we have a Joseph who was there as his father when he came on earth in flesh, and another Joseph who takes mm. care of his body when he left the earth in flesh. It is amazing that the root of the name Joseph means the Lord adds mm. or he takes away. Mm. <laughs> There's no mistake, like, yeah, you can't, who would write this? It's too good. It's yeah. too complete. It's too full circle all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And on the live comment of this video on Facebook, uh, there is a post of, uh, Ricardo just posted about that Sabbath situation. So the you guys two can Sabbaths. check it. Thank you. Yep, yeah. That's, I think that's the one, Ricardo. Mm -hmm. So you guys can check that out. So, yep. Isn't that crazy? It's awesome, huh? Well, that's the last comment, you guys. Um... I hope that uh, this video blessed you. I, you guys blessed us, I know, for your comments and the time you take and uh, for reading with us. And also, I'm going to say it again. You don't have to give a big, huge, uh, you know, awesome, mind-melting, bending, um, you know, comment. Just saying, hello, I'm here, love the videos, or hey, inspired by the scriptures here and stuff like that. Like it's equally as important because it lets everybody know that there's a whole bunch of people out there watching this and a whole bunch of people fellowshipping about the Lord and, and fellowship is a blessing for all of us to see and participate in. So yeah, just want to say thank you guys very much. Uh, Alex has got to take a quick call. So I'll go ahead and uh, log off here, but you guys be blessed, be the blessing and we will see you soon. And I will have more updates too, with everything going on with me. I want to just also say thank you everybody for your, your uh, amazing support and um, 
and uh, your just patience with me, as I know I have been super MIA now for like a month, and uh, and there's so much wonderful things I do want to bring you up to speed on and talk to you about and fellowship with you about and testify about that the Lord's doing in my life, and it's it's pretty cool stuff. So I'm super pumped about it. Again, returning returning more back to the Lord, trying to really seek more of the Lord's will in my life, and I can testify that uh, the Lord has has just continued to bless me. And uh, I, I love having, I'm grateful. I'm grateful I have that testimony. So yeah, have a great night. And thank you again for all your participation. Talk to you all soon.